So once again, welcome to the Well of Being Wednesday here at the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Really, yes. Was that a woohoo? Thank you. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, yeah, this is an evening where we come together to be in community with one another, reflect on the teachings and get some time to practice and maybe most importantly, if not extremely importantly, reflect on a lot of the questions and ideas that come up as a result of practice and in reflecting on the teachings. This evening, we are going to return. We took our Valentine's Day detour, which was quite enjoyable, a little self-love action last week. We're coming back to this book, which we are making. I, I really love, I feel like we are going to make spirals in this book. There's not like a chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. So much of it really uh, is this circular practice and process of what Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche calls soul retrieval. Yes, it's good, uh, good emphasis there. And in this, in this tonight, we are going to return to these three precious pills. It's been really heartening to hear members of the Sangha here, the community share that they're able to really feel those three precious pills, right? That they actually come alive for them and times when they need it. So that's our stillness, our silence and our warmth and feeling of openness. So we will do a meditation in which we focus on those three qualities. And um, we will also start tonight to do the, I'd say like the heart of the practice and the heart of the practice is connecting to the natural essences. So Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche offers these practices drawn from ancient Bon Buddhism, in which you really invite in the qualities of earth, of space, of air, of water. And it's interesting um, to really call these in and be with them. So it'll give us a little preamble to doing that. And tonight, we're going to connect with earth. Everyone good with that? Like, Earth is cool, right? <laughs> Some of us prefer water, others like air, but I think it's foundational to start with Earth. And I, I got a little time this weekend to prepare for our practice together and um, kind of reflect on practicing with Earth, and I found it extremely beneficial and useful. So I look forward to sharing that. And one thing I want to start with this week, which uh, I really appreciate, I can't remember your name in the pink hat. Yes, Susan. But what Susan brought up, which is so important, it is how do we have a sense of safety and okayness in order to practice? It actually is really not easy to just like drop into our body and all of a sudden let go of the worries, the frustrations, the anxieties, both in our personal life and in our greater life. And there's a bit of kind of um, easing in. Like I, I think of my cat when he wants to lay down and he kind of walks around the area first, right? Like tamps it down. Is this the coziest place? So I need to be over here. And so I want us to spend a little time just establishing a sense of presence here. And this comes at two levels, safety and a feeling of kind of relative, both psychological safety, physical safety is something we do with the environment. It's also something we do internally. It's like a shift. And with the environment, I really appreciate the trauma-informed mindfulness. So these are a lot of the practices that have come up in teaching meditation and mindfulness to huge different groups of people with a whole different group, different varieties of nervous system activation. And one of the simple ones is really looking around the room. Right. Like noticing where we are, noticing where the door is. We got Jimmy at the door. What's up? Jimmy's here, like really feeling our sense of like, OK, like I know where I am. You know, another part of it is like establishing a sense of our own space within this room. For some folks, it could feel comfortable to look around and see other faces. And for others, it's like the least comfortable thing, <laughs> right? So it might be you know, encouraging, especially if you come here often and you're like, oh yeah, hey, familiar faces. For others, it's also just good to feel established here in your presence and your body. And I wanna share something about kind of inviting. We, we can't force it, both like we can't force a sense of, okay, now that I've looked around and established myself, I feel safe. We're just trying, right? And I 
there's also an invitation of how do we orient towards a feeling of safety in our mind, in our heart. That's an attitude shift in a way. And Wangel Rinpoche, he, he beautifully describes what we want. He says, your safest haven. There is no better protection than the refuge of unbounded sacred space, infinite awareness, and genuine warmth. Any external source of refuge is ultimately unreliable. Looking for refuge in money or material possessions cannot protect you from the pain of loss because everything you have will be lost to you someday. No matter how good your health insurance is or how healthy your lifestyle, sooner or later, you'll suffer injury and sickness and eventually you'll die. Finding your perfect soulmate can't protect you from someday losing, losing your beloved. So not to get us on such a downer, but his invitation is like, where is the true refuge? And it may not immediately feel like, oh yeah, it's in me. This place of all my neurotic thoughts and anxieties and comparisons that might not be obvious that true refuge is within us, but just this possibility, like, huh, maybe a safe place is right here in cultivating a sense of presence in my mind, heart, and body. And this relates so beautifully to these three precious pills, because these three precious pills of body, speech, and mind, they're supposed to be how our body, speech, and mind are naturally, like without any contrivance, not something we earn or something we generate, but that our natural state of our body and our speech and our mind are stillness, silence, warmth, and openness. Does anybody believe in that possibility? Yeah. And <laughs> I like Karen's like, maybe. Um, so I, I really, I kind of love that invitation and that consideration that there is a true refuge that's right here. And I also want to speak to something uh, not put you on the spot, but that Isaac shared last week, which I thought was extremely important, which was, I think my mind is racing and this is hard. Was, was that it kind of? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and which I think many people experience that in meditation. Like this is hard. My mind is racing. Like it's very hard to settle. And that can lead to kind of a gripping and like a contraction, like I just got to try harder. You know, I can't feel spacious. I want to feel spacious. <laughs> and, you know, it, it sounds funny, but it actually, it feels quite defeating. And my suggestion last week, and I kind of want to prime it for us um, in our meditation tonight is how kind and gentle can you be with yourself when your mind inevitably gets carried away by distraction? That is the nature of mind to be distracted. It's not an aberration and it's not something we're looking to get rid of in practice. It's something that we're looking to not make the primary focus. So for many people, a huge insight in meditation is discovering my mind isn't just thoughts. There's actually this other real estate that's available, right? It's not just this constant thought, this constant thought. And so the invitation, instead of getting rid of or um, denying or kind of feeling a sense of overwhelm or failure when we get caught away, it's, okay, let me redirect, redirect to spaciousness, redirect to openness. And, you know, the two beautiful metaphors that are often used with that is one is like being, some of you have seen it often happens at like the the edge of cliffs or somewhere like Twin Peaks where you have a hawk that's looking down, it's doing its hunting at the end of the day. And because of San Francisco winds, there's a lot of wind, right? And the hawk is all kind of like tucked in, right? It's focused and all these winds are going against it, but it's not moving. And the idea is that we can feel like the wind is those thoughts moving through. And, but we are like so secure and stable in our awareness that we experience stillness amid movement. So that's one way to imagine it, one um, analogy. Another analogy um, I like, a very common one is the clouds and the sky. And we are associating ourselves more, our mind with the sky. 
from the clouds or like those thoughts that are going by, right? Another could be watching a meteor shower, right? Your thoughts, but it's not, you know, that's not you. You don't need to um, be identified with those meteors. They're just happening. Thoughts feel so personal because they're like all your stuff, right? And yet we don't have to make them the primary focus of our experience. So just an invitation. And I love what he says here. Um, he says, the more effort you, you put into connecting with stillness, silence, and spaciousness, the more elusive inner refuge seems. Connecting with inner refuge is simply a matter of shifting your attention. If you're already still, be aware of stillness. When you are silent, hear the silence that is already there. Notice the spaciousness at the very center of your being. As you rest in awareness, you connect with your authentic self. The effort of seeking dissipates and you are unbounded sacred space, infinite awareness and genuine warmth. You are the inner refuge. So I think that's such an encouraging message, right? So don't like effort, don't try so hard. If, if it's like, you know, we're trying to do stillness and I just feel agitated and moving. Okay. Be aware there's agitation and movement. Is there also stillness, right? Like kind of both and, right? Not one or the other. And, and I love this suggestion because I, I myself has experienced it. I know others have had it too. When you can relax and be with partially how these qualities are showing up, they gain their own momentum within you and we can feel that. So he describes, you know, this unbounded sacred space. It's a very beautiful term. And it really, I think qualitatively just feels like being at ease, but being totally right and present. So the sacredness, not just space, right? The sacredness, this almost magic of being present with what's here. I think about it when, if you've had an opportunity, you somehow didn't have any electronic device with you, you're sitting there looking somewhere beautiful. Maybe it's a sunset, maybe it's at the ocean and you're just looking without really kind of searching for anything. And more and more things start to kind of show up. You're like, I didn't notice, like there's that other shadow there and oh, and the light there. And it's kind of like letting the richness of your inner experience become more available. Like for those of you who ever used a dark room, you're like looking at a photo as it's developing and it starts, the image starts to arise. So I hope some of those pointing to might be helpful. But we're going to go ahead and, and do a practice here. And the practice will have five steps. So I'll tell you them now, but then we'll just, I'll guide you through them. Um, the first step, which I, it's not even, I won't even consider it in the five, is we are going to settle into the stillness, the silence, and the spaciousness. And then I will ask you a question to really consider and connect with what are you missing in terms of vitality and energy, presence? These practices are ones of soul retrieval, meaning coming back to the fullness of who we really are. So to kind of connect with that yearning, like what am I missing? And then we will work with just hosting the feeling of missing. Can we meet that sense of what we're missing? Then we'll kind of see if we can have a feeling of our warmth, our basic presence that will be cultivated and supported by the preliminary parts of our practice. And then we will connect to the element of earth. And we'll do this through imagination. And I didn't plan just an amazing amount of earth to show up here all of a sudden for our practice. But just as when we practice loving kindness, we bring to mind someone we care for, and it elicits a sense of warmth and care. We bring to mind an aspect of the natural world. Come on in, no problem. Um, and that can elicit a sense of the quality 
And it's really, it's really interesting to think about this. Like, what does it mean to bring to mind an image of, you know, let's say being sitting on a mountain, being on a trail, being in a backyard? It can seem a little like fanciful, right? Like, why would I just bring this image to mind? How's that going to help my practice? But we, we know clearly that bringing to mind this sense of connection and relationality with another in compassion or kindness, it makes us feel positive states. Like it really does engender that in us. And so the invitation in this practice and in all of these practices is to have that relationality with the natural world. And that in some ways I'm inviting you into animism here. Right. Mm -hmm. To feel the aliveness of the natural world as something you can connect to, feel connected with, build relationship with. So just so you know, that's what we're going to do. Getting into the more than human world and its beautiful aliveness. And then we're going to kind of rest in that or find some space within that. And um, those are our steps. So let's find postures that support our practice. Beginning our meditation and practice together by drawing attention and awareness to the body. In this first phase of the practice, this first of the three precious pills, we invite our attention and awareness towards a sense of stillness in the body. And the stillness isn't just that we aren't moving, going anywhere, coming from anywhere. It's a stillness that's a choice and deliberate. Every time the mind gets caught up and carried away with a sound or sensation or thought, you can find kindness and care and curiosity and just come back. Really fully saturating our body with attention and awareness. And finding this natural stability, this natural stillness of the body.
Of course, our mind wants to wander and may find itself distracted. But the more and more moments that we stitch together of being present within the sensations of the body, we may find this subtler and subtler experience of stillness in the body that's infusing all the subtle movements also happening in the body, various forms of energy, areas around the face, or the chest, or the belly. And even with this aliveness of the body, seeing if we can rest or put preference towards the sense of stillness in the body. As we feel more connected to stillness, even for brief moments, we may be able to invite or naturally feel the presence of some silence. Even with the car alarms or the sound of breath, there is silence that is actually always all around us. And in this particular connection to silence, we invite the inner speech or that ongoing commentary to settle. And it can be very helpful to do so by following the breath more closely. So as we inhale, really knowing, feeling the sense of inhale. As we exhale, knowing and feeling the sense of exhale. Every single time we recognize we've been carried away with thought, memory, image, fantasy, is a new opportunity to reestablish ourselves with the breath, to remember why we're here, to see if we can be kind as we return, refresh, maybe even rejoice in knowing every time we come back, we're strengthening our focus, our awareness.
while still maintaining a sense of awareness and attention to following the natural rhythm of the breath. See and notice if a sense of more spacious warmth might naturally arise. So the stability of a still body, this invitation to silence, lowering the inner chatter may naturally give rise to the sense of more warmth, more openness. No need to seek it out, just an invitation to notice if it's there. If it is, and that's available, and resting in that sense of warmth and openness. Otherwise, maintaining this light attention to the breath, just this knowing of breathing, not trying to change the breath or count the breath or understand the breath, just knowing we are breathing the most bare and simple way. Relax, release, rejoice whenever you get carried away. And just return to the breath, the body, and possibility and invitation to warmth and spaciousness. We gently shift our attention and awareness to reflection. And as we move towards the sense of gaining access to the earth element, we begin with a reflection of where in our life might we need more ground? Where is it we feel unstable, uncertain, lacking that sense of foundational presence, stability? So let this be a reflection and maybe an image or word comes to mind, maybe a specific scenario or situation. Try not to over-engage in thinking about it. Let, let it come to the surface. Where in your life do you need more ground, more earth? Where does it feel unstable, uncertain, shaky? Could be your relationship to another person, to yourself. 
to your material world, work and resource. And when we recognize wherever it is, we are experiencing this lack of ground. Can we relax there? Can we host that feeling just the way the sky hosts a cloud? In order for there to be a true transformation, there has to be this recognition, this yearning, this clear seeing of where there is a lack. Maybe notice how this reflection might shift or change sensations in the body. Maybe some contraction arises or tenderness. I'm really staying here in this moment, in this breath, in this body, even as we reflect. Then we shift our attention and awareness again to imagination, to the mind. Consider bringing to mind a place in which you really feel a connection with the qualities of earth, groundedness, support. Maybe this is a favorite trail. Maybe this is a backyard. Maybe a specific area in the mountains. Take a moment and really feel and imagine the aliveness of being in this area, this connection to the earth. Feel and imagine through all five senses. What is it like to be? held by the earth, sense of ground and presence, stability. Maybe you feel some wind moving past you or the warmth of sunlight. Maybe there's the smell of the earth or flowers, trees. Really vividly imagine and bring to mind these aspects of relationality and connection with Earth. With the next breaths, feel and imagine inviting this essence of earth here and now so to be right here with you. Feel it within you, around you. And permeating our awareness with this presence of earth.
If the feeling is subtle, maybe the details aren't quite clear, no problem at all. Just imagine that sense of connection with earth through the natural world. And if the sensations are palpable, really invite them in breath by breath, feeling them infuse the body, mind, and heart. Feel especially these qualities reaching the parts of our life where we most need this ground, this support, this protection. Feel and imagine the possibility that this sense of earth is not out there, but that we can feel that within us. No separation between these qualities of earth and what's immediately available, part of what we already are. Groundedness, stability, protection. If the feeling of earth gets diffuse, you can once again bring the image of a special place in mind. Otherwise, you can relax or rest into this feeling of unbounded sacred space, connected with earth and grounded. Take a moment and notice the body, the heart, maybe even the quality of mind in this moment. And when the bell rings, see if you can maintain and sustain any qualities of being the very ground that you are looking for, being the stability, and being the presence.
Thanks everyone for your practice. So as we move towards part of our time together where there's more discussion and reflection, just a reminder or invitation of what it means to be in community together. Reconstellating every single week together requires such a high level of awareness, attention, and compassion to one another. So our practice of cultivating the heart and the mind and the body, of course we do it sitting with our eyes closed, but also really in how we take in one another, how we communicate, how we listen. It's a very challenging practice, right? Come on in, nice to see you. So this, you know, ability to really listen, like as though our ears were filled with compassion and like our eyes were just made of compassion. And it's so essential to recognize that everybody here is just coming with so many different varieties of lived experience. And while visually we may look around and think, oh yeah, they're, they're that kind of person or this kind of person, we have no idea. Not only the lived past experiences in this room, but like what we're coming with today in this moment. So just a real gentleness and kindness with each other. And I think the foundation of that can be such appreciation for everyone who's here showing up. Truly every single person makes it possible for us to do this work here and really enriches it. So with that, and I, I love... I love saying this. I heard Anne Klein say this, this beautiful teacher of really um, seeing everybody as Buddhas on their way, right? So not maybe not there yet, some of us, maybe a little far, but on our way and having and holding that um, image of one another. Um, so yeah, I have more to share on earth as an element in practice, not as a planet. I'm unqualified for that. But any reflections or questions on that practice? The first time we've invited an earth element, big deal, pretty exciting. Any any thoughts or questions on that practice? Yeah, I second if you don't mind, thanks. <laughs> Sorry, you kind of went over this in the practice, but with the loving kindness practice, imagining someone you care about, it's like an obvious way to evoke loving kindness. But imagining Earth, is there a thing you're trying to evoke more directly, like a concrete thing? I know. I wish it was like a little, but I mean, loving kindness is also intangible and invisible. This but, is true. So, yes, but earth and the quality of it, like we can see earth, right? We can like put our feet in it, touch it, but the quality and that, you know, it does require, you know, in, in the book, he says, make a date with the elements, right? Like <laughs> go sit on earth. Yeah. And it's not to notice like the tactile, it's to notice like, what is it like when you feel held? So if you don't mind me asking, like, is there a time or place in which you feel like being held, like the ground of the earth holding you? You mean like, have I felt that before? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think I felt it during the practice while developing myself in earth Yeah. mentally. Yeah, yeah. Great. But I, I guess maybe to rephrase, like yeah. in, in this analogy, the earth is the person you care about. Yes. While trying to evoke loving kindness but is the earth evoking some other concept or is it itself the thing that we yeah. care, care about very good question you know the it like breaks down a little the analogy but with loving kindness though we're generated for that person like technically it's actually to just see that it's alive in us already so with earth we kind of break down that part of like wishing the earth something and instead it's just this like, wow, seeing it, feeling it, oh my gosh, it's already in here. Um, and, you know, that towards the end of the practice, his instruction is to really, like, lose a sense of us and the earth as in any way separate and see if we can feel 
I got press it. I mean, it does, it gets a little, uh, what's the word? Beyond what we can concretely understand and just an invitation of, can we feel that? Um, which is of course, another move towards a non-dual state of consciousness. And um, that non-dual consciousness sounds very fancy, but it really means like we get to drop the identity that we're carrying around and just feel that sensory and uh, um, it's not just senses, it's beyond the senses, like consciousness sense of being without like I am being, just this being. Um, but there is, uh, oh my God, so much literature on this, so much writing on it, but it all is intended towards, can we feel that? One more quick question. Please. Would you say it's more accurate to say I'm trying to feel like I am earth or I evoke the quality of earth, like stability? Both. Okay. Because I think there is an important, like part of Wangyal Rinpoche's, um, and and the the Bon Tibetan tradition is really developing relationality to the natural world. So we don't want to cut the natural world out and be like, oh, I don't even need her. It's already here. Like we want that ongoing interbeing. In the same way with loving kindness, is we really want it to impact how we interact with others. Uh, and so relevant for our time, right? When there is so much distress over um, our impending climate catastrophe. And most of our relationship to the natural world is like, oh fuck, <laughs> like this is gonna get worse. And I think developing this like kind, benevolent relationship to the living world is it's very powerful. And part of this um, UC wide course on uh, mindfulness for climate distress for undergrads. And a, a lot of those practices are calming anxiety. And I'm, I'm always pointing to Wangyal Rinpoche and like, let's, let's cultivate joy, you know, not just calming anxiety. Though that, you know, the climate catastrophe was not a worry when these practices were happening, but there is something, and, and Wangyal Rinpoche says this in the book, he, he wonders if part of the contemporary malaise of disconnection, lack of belonging and anxiety that's part of certain contemporary cultures is our disconnection from the natural world. And there, you know, I think we're so fortunate here in San Francisco, we can really have a sense of it even without having to leave the city. And I wonder that improves over, well, I don't wonder, I know it improves overall well-being. There, there was a study I actually, I'll just bring it up now, I wanted to share with you all. Um, there's been quite a lot of work looking at Shinrin Yoku forest bathing, right? So this was research that started in Japan, really examining the impact of being in the forest. It's like, okay, I like there's a fancy word for it, but it's uh, being in the forest with all your senses. So not being in the forest, like taking photos or like, you know, like you're really, really there. And there's such beneficial qualities like to our um, immune system functioning, our overall well-being. But it's not just being in the forest. It's also even just exposure to nature images. So there was, you know, there's estimated 5.3 million people just in North America who uh, live and or work in very nature deprived environments. So that you can imagine that could be in neighborhoods where there's been a lack of urban planning and they're the kind of discarded, um, less privileged areas and there's not access to nature. Um, folks who are living with incarceration, you know, without access to nature. And the studies that have been done, especially with folks experiencing incarceration, just a year of nature image videos significantly reduced feelings of anxiety, irritation, improved feelings of um, well-being and calmness overall. And actually at a behavioral level, as a scientist, you always want this like, okay, it's nice that people said that, but behaviorally there was less incidences of violence by a drop by 26% watching nature videos, right? So there is something here, you know, in, in bringing and inviting. And it's one thing to be in nature. It's another thing to like connect with the natural world. 
Thank you. Yeah. I want to ask like a related question. Could the prompt be something like being of nature? Mm -hmm. Because the way that you're framing it still makes me feel like there's a separation and this relationality, whereas maybe the relationality, you mentioned the non-duality. Yes. And just the, that. And I think we're like of it and with it. It's like interesting because we, again, we don't want to be the center of the frame, right? Like we want that interrelationality. I'm sure there's such great phrasing in so many um, like of our ancestors had to describe their relationality with it. But I love that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of it, with it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions and reflections? Earth practice. Oh, yeah. Yep, two over here. Mine is short. It's interesting what you said about seeing nature because for me, I didn't like this. Snakes kept coming up. Oh. Again and again, snakes. Yeah, that's. Have you had some snake encounters? I went to Spirit Rock and I was meditating, and there was a Buddha, and then I opened my eyes and there was a snake. There were like three or four snakes on that trip. So, yeah, I've had meditation and snakes. Yeah. Again. So, I think, you know, um, Interestingly, because there is there is some literature also on nature isn't necessarily comforting for everyone all the time. It's depending on experience and exposure, right? And so backyard might be a great place to imagine as opposed to like, you know, so like, or Golden Gate Park. Um, so something where there's, you know, a safe place because absolutely like that can impact you. And it will likely soften, but I don't think, um, unless you can meet the snakes with warmth and compassion, but that's like a different practice. So it might be good to, you know, um, again, make the date with nature, go like sit in the park for 20 minutes and just be, and maybe that can establish a different um, connection. Thanks for sharing. I, so often in these meditations, there's kind of the metaphor of earth, but I often find myself going to the kind of literal, and I feel like I overthink this, but I can't not do it. So it just kind of comes into my brain, but I go into the literal, like what is earth? And out of pure coincidence, this morning at 4am when I can sleep, I was reading about dirt. And that's premonition. I, really good book, whole chapter about dirt. And it was talking about kind of what dirt is. And just this will be, I, I feel like there's probably a bunch of people here who are like, this is the most obvious thing in the world. But to me, it kind of blew my mind of thinking, oh, well, I think dirt's like the brown stuff you walk around on. But it's completely, it's utterly alive. Mm -hmm. And just thinking literally about in that chapter, I was walking through like all the different components of dirt and them are you know dead like rocks of different sizes all have different names and different ratios of them mean different kind of earth and then there's the living part of it and all of the organic matter and they had this exercise of just grab a jar of earth fill it with water and then just shake it and leave it for a day and watch it separate out and that's how you can tell what kind of dirt it is by all the different layers in it and this image was coming to mind during the meditation i was like you think about that and you think about all the immense care that a, mm -hmm. a farmer has to put in to keep the dirt alive so it's not dead and can still grow crops or can you know propagate life and you can kill it mm -hmm. or you can care for it and it's her thinking man like that doesn't sound that different from me at all you know in a very literal sense like mm -hmm. it actually does need loving kindness yeah and it can suffer if it doesn't receive it and it actually does need nutrition and nourishment mm -hmm. and so without going to the metaphor i was like yeah I'm, I'm the same i feel exactly the same sweet beautiful yeah and i think that feels like a nice uh extra credit project for making a date with nature you know of like reading about the dirt and really you know becoming interested and curious and um Again, it's it is like most most of us, not everyone. There's like some like yeah, I like nature, you know, it's good. I mean, there's even a study about people who had more house plants during COVID had better well being. Right? All right, like there's something good. We like it even if it's a potted plant. 
but what does it mean to like that relationality? Such a beautiful invitation. And maybe it is through, I really want to understand this, you know, like the particles of it, but it might just be, you know, like the classic touching of the earth, right? Which Buddha did right before his awakening as a way to establish confidence that he could actually awaken. Anyway. True, true. <laughs> Thank you. I can't stop about the connection between body and earth, mm. like uh, as one, right? Or one, an extension of the other one, mm. as the same <clears throat> refuge that I could have in my body as in the refuge that you promoted with earth, mm. right? Yeah. It feels a little bit of, of the same. It feels a little bit of, of the same element, I would say. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. The same quality of, uh, um, I don't know, compared to the heart that is somewhere else, it's somewhere higher. Mm. The body, it's truly, if I am in it, it's truly grounded and it's truly attached to earth. Yeah. So, um, so what? I don't know. No, beautiful. That's, that's, that is, yeah. And that direct experience of feeling the body as that quality of earth, right? Hey, good. So similar to that thought, it reminded me of uh, Alan, Alan Watts' comparison of an apple tree, mm. you know, in the sense that it's a uh, apple tree apples and the earth peoples, <laughs> in the sense that. that we very much come out of the earth. Mm. Um, and of course, we certainly go back into it. Um, and it also reminds me of a, uh, you know, there's a concept in, in Hinduism, the gods exist within you. Mm -hmm. And so if you are chanting to Ganesha, are you chanting to a seven-year-old with the head of an elephant to remove mm -hmm. obstacles? Or are you chanting to that part of yourself yeah. that simply removes our obstacles and doesn't really matter? Yeah. Um, and, you know, all that you are God mm -hmm. that exists within you, right? So. Yeah. Beautiful. You and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Any questions online? Any friends' comments or questions online? Sonata, you're our, you're actually our host, huh? <laughs> no. Okay. Oh. Okay. Good. Thanks, Jason. Um, so I wanted to to share a little bit more, <clears throat> especially about. Um, what Wangyal Rinpoche shares about earth itself um, and this earth element. Yeah, he says, uh, when making a date with nature, you can be assured that unlike some of your friends and relatives, nature will not judge you. <laughs> <laughs> try to convince you of anything or expect anything of you to make the connection. All that's required of you is to be still within yourself, silence your internal chatter and open your heart. And, you know, that's, that's where we bring like the three pills to be in the natural world, right? These three precious pills. So when we go to nature, we can practice that sense of, can we here find the stillness, the silence, the openness? And, you know, some of you may remember from Old Path White Clouds, this beautiful sutta, where the Buddha talks about how the earth, it receives whatever we have to offer it. Like, be like earth, it receives everything we have to offer it. <clears throat> Unfortunately, in our current age of environmental degradation, that's not entirely true. But in our kind of local moment of being with the earth, the earth will hold us if we are angry. The earth will hold us if we are joyful. The earth will hold us if we're harboring resentments, jealousy, right? It's really is this non judgmental, friendly presence. And there's something, yeah, so interesting about 
the roots of these practices that are calling upon the elements as you know these great guides because any of you who know even a little bit about tibetan buddhism a lot of deities too right you can call on and of course in hinduism there's so many like beautiful representations and these kind of more exalted figures but the natural world you know to really see the kind of godlike qualities or the sacred qualities in the natural world it's so accessible, I feel, so so reassuring in a way. And um, yeah, and I think this invitation, I actually wanted to ask folks, was that when I said like, where in your life is this missing? Was that clear? Could you kind of get a signal of that? Like, oh, where do I need this quality? Somewhat, yeah, because I, I think it's, you know, I, I appreciate his invitation here that most of us are definitely in need of revitalization. Uh, it's his general assessment, but that it's so important as part of these practices to get really clear on like where we are missing these specific elements in our life. Just like you wouldn't want to just go into the medicine cabinet and take like any pill or supplement, right? <laughs> you want to know what am I taking and why? Like, what am I feeling? Do I need Advil? Do I need magnesium? Do I need some like B or D? So it's how do we get clear on like what is missing and lacking? Now, um, I, I will say it gets a little bit it gets a little bit complex. I won't say confusing, but it does get complex how he describes these elements. So I'm going to go over them many, many, many times. But I hope at first this sounds somewhat um, kind of natural and obvious, these qualities. So with earth, the basic qualities are groundedness and connectedness. With water, the basic quality is comfort and fluidity. So, you know, I actually hear, I know we have a number of um, surfers in the Sangha, friends. He's not really talking about that kind of water. He's always about like streams and waterfalls. Because when I think of comfort and fluidity, like sometimes, <laughs> but in the ocean, it's like terror and <laughs> energy and power, right? So the comfort and fluidity, like I really think of this more as being with the river as it's flowing not being against it, like that quality, you know, very much be like water, of course, um, and now made famous. And fire might be a little less obvious, but it I really appreciate when I hear it and it makes sense to me, which is the basic quality of joy and inspiration, that kind of fire, joy and inspiration. And then with air, flexibility and movement, which are like kind of an interesting one. It sounds, I mean, there's a little bit of like comfort and fluidity, but the flexibility and movement. So there's, yeah, it's interesting because for me, I always expect to see wind and not air. And I do feel the very like powerful quality of wind to make change. But in this, it's like kind of all encompassing flexibility and movement. The one that really encompasses all of them, and in some ways is like a necessary quantity for any of these to be experienced, is space. And that is the quality of openness and accommodation. So if there isn't that sense of like openness and accommodation, we can't have the joy and inspiration of fire. It might be really difficult to connect with the comfort and fluidity of water. So that's how he builds um, on each of these. And then I want to share a little bit about how specifically he goes into earth, but any questions on those, on those elements? And if they're really good questions, we can ask them to Juan Gil Ripache in three weeks, because you know, I'm, we are very fortunate he'll be joining us. Yeah. Oh. I'm not that good of a toss. Oh, fine. I'm, a, well, I'm not going to say that. Um, <laughs> Stop censoring. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
All right. Um, yeah, I just wanted like a clarification between like air and then space, like just, I don't know, is it could be a vacuum or whatever um, that air. I, yeah, I mean, because you said both things, but were you kind of, I don't know. I, yeah, they're, okay. they are different. Okay. And I think it's interesting, like um, the like the deeper level is he says with air, Re, uh, feel flexible, free moving, healing, lively, light, fresh, penetrating, magical, transformative, communicative. Okay. Many qualities. And then with space, it's still just open, accommodating, and vast. I feel like air has this kind of energy. And because of, um, you know, some knowledge in the Chinese and Tibetan medicines, I always think of wind, which is actually not a great quality to have too much of. But I think this air is really way more of like that air can permeate everything and anything. So can space, but it's like the openness accommodation of space. Okay. I know. It's a little bit. Yeah, I just, I just. No, thank you. Good question. No, I was yeah. I think it it is tricky to especially like Earth. So I started with Earth. It's like, oh yeah, groundedness makes sense. The other qualities and developing relationship with it could be a little trickier, right? It might be a little take more time to develop that. Um, so with I want to add a little bit more here. So with the Earth, when you have too little. You feel ungrounded, unstable, dissatisfied, disconnected, spacey, agitated, and ever searching restlessness. Mm -hmm. Anybody identify? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think um, especially the dissatisfied and disconnected, it's interesting to think of that as associated with the quality of Earth's or the lack of quality of earth, that when we are grounded and rooted, we're not seeking, we're not looking, we're not needing more than what is already here with us. And then when you have too much earth, which um, can also happen, you will feel dull and lazy, unable to move, insensitive, stubborn, depressed, withdrawn, fixed, and you tend to oversleep. So I think it's, you know, it is interesting to hear like all of the different nuance of how to kind of self-diagnose and then retrieve and receive that energy again. And so when we're thinking about earth and connecting a relationship to it, we need to have that sense of what can we gain? Like, what can we be looking for? So I'd love us to do one more practice. I kind of wanted to do a preliminary practice of moving into earth. And then now that we have a little more sense, we'll just spend maybe another five to eight minutes seeing if bringing up these specific qualities kind of helps us feel that presence of earth. <laughs> And so returning and reconnecting to a sense of fully being in the body. Seeing if it's available to reconnect to the stillness in the body. In the silence of speech. And the spaciousness and openness and warmth of mind.
revisiting or maybe reacquainting with that sense of where are we experiencing the lack of ground or the agitation, dissatisfaction? Where in our life do we really need or want to invite this, this essence of earth? Can we host this sense of lack or needing with such care and kindness? Well, feeling the vulnerability of recognizing where we need support. And then shifting our attention and awareness into inviting this quality of earth. Maybe we could have a sense of feeling it beneath our feet. Maybe there's a place in which we really feel that groundedness, that stability, that connection. For a moment, connect to that idea, that invitation that the earth can hold whatever we have. The earth can hold our stresses and our sorrows, can hold our joys and our longings. Get that embodied sense of support, ground, connection. Without judgment, without preference, holding up whatever we are here with. And the invitation that we could experience something like nourishment. A sense of deep fulfillment, bringing to mind and merging our sense of self with this quality of earth. Feeling the presence of earth within us, as us, through us. With this quality of earth, it might actually feel different to be in the body and mind and heart. Notice, is there a different experience of being here with this groundedness and connection?
for a couple more moments, see if you can either rest in the sense of being present with these qualities of earth, or maybe oscillate between bringing to mind this presence of earth and then resting, almost like the bird that's flapping its wings and then gliding, refreshing and reminding this quality of earth and then resting, gliding upon that quality and feeling. And if there's any glimpse of what it feels like to connect and be of or with the earth, what might it be like to bring this into our life? Let's consider that possibility and that opportunity. Thank you for your practice. I felt like a little dropped down. Maybe everyone was just asleep, but maybe there was more earth quality in that second practice. Any reflections or questions? Yes, please. Gravity inevitably shows up in relation to earth. Can, is this, do you see this as a quality? like? We're part of the practice, like connecting and bending our body to the force of gravity. Yeah, it's a really interesting question because I I avoid saying that. I've never read that instruction of feel gravity, but it is, right? We know that we are held in some ways up, but we're also held down, <laughs> right? And so I, I don't think of it per se as like a quality of earth, but I do notice, and maybe this is what you're alluding to, I feel the weight of my, like I feel gravity more. And it's not that gravity isn't there. It's just usually I'm so busy, you know, thinking and doing that I don't recognize this being physical form and that physical form has this weight. Um, so I think it's interesting. I'd be curious, does it feel like a, a distraction or just a inquiry of like, how gravity I'm just wondering if this makes us part of the earth. Yeah, I, I don't it's a good question. You know, um, I don't think per se gravity as a concept existed when these practices were created. Um, but I'm gonna put that on our list of questions for Rip Pache. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear his thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, yes, not, Jenny. Yeah, on that last on that last cue when you said invite. Hi, everyone. When you said invite the um, earth in to the body, I felt that happened. And then I felt the earthiness of my body in my bones, like come out and mm -hmm. eat the invitation mm -hmm. that you were bringing in. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, it was really beautiful. I think there's the um, the good jazz band quality because like taking what others said, like oh, wit, like just the words they matter so much. Yeah, it matters. And certain combinations really make it come alive for us. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, 
when you talked about, uh, I imagine a moment where you're sort of lacking this experience, and I was thinking about this um, kind of contention between myself and a coworker where I'm feeling like, like, and I kind of grow about it. And the, when you talked about ground, I thought, oh, I've got to stand my ground. Mm. And then I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, that this is sort of becoming like this sort of like, it's mine. Right. It's yours. And yes. I mean, you know, her, like I have to and it became territory and all of that. And then when we started to go, you were starting to guide us more into the qualities of the earth. It felt that that's not even part of it. It felt like it was much more just receptive and yeah. um, cultivating growth and encouragement and tenderness. And so I just, I just sort of became aware of how I'm like, I'm able to hear these elements but sort of filter them through my kind of, you know, neurotic, uh, whatever, insecurities or whatever. So yeah, that was but, but it opened up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's such a great insight, right? Because yeah. we can kind of take any practice or method towards our own agenda, right? And that's like yeah. spiritual materialism, in a way, yeah, 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 right. like using spiritual practice to just kind of perpetuate our own ego's agenda. Yeah. But it can be tough. It's like, oh yeah, stand my ground. That's earthy. Right. I, I think that's really that's so interesting. And like I think about, you know, the earth has no boundaries. Right. There are there is no territories on the earth. Those are fabricated, right? Imposed upon it. Um yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I know when I first started practicing, I would see like the earth, like the little green blue marble you know, and get a sense of like awe, but that's not this practice. So it's like, we can, it's very interesting where our kind of um, imagination can go. And it's not, it's not necessarily that awe and imagining the earth is wrong or bad. It's just very different than being supported. Like standing your ground is very different than feeling like, okay, I can be with what's here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So like one of the one of the qualities of too much earth was stubbornness yeah <laughs> when you have too much stubborn yeah, yeah so it's kind of yeah holding your ground and all yeah. that right yeah i think there's a question that way around yeah hello hello um i could maybe it's a luxury problem but i couldn't land on one spot yeah I was having a hard time i was like taking a tour of all of the beautiful places i've been in my mind and having a hard time really i, I attached myself to a, a tree at one point and i'm like well, what about that meadow yes. like, it's hard for me to settle yeah thank you for sharing that it's such an important point and the same comes up with loving kindness practice right when we're like oh, I should really offer it to this person. Oh no, but what about that? Like, oh, it's been so long, right? So it can be hard to choose. Um, I do think sometimes, you know, coming up with it beforehand and being like, I'm just gonna stick to this one can help. But I'd really, I really would love to invite you all to do some enjoyable homework this week, if you feel so inclined and make the date with somewhere, like make the date with earth and you can get your, happy handful, as Raf said, and put it in a jar. Or you can just, like, I um, I went to San Pedro Mountain this last weekend and practiced with one hand on the earth. And yeah, it's a little moist, but um, God, it is so powerful, right? And it really, it can be just so enlivening of the senses to practice outside, period, right? Like, so much that is coming in. And then to really dedicate of like, wow, this this, you know, what is the quality I can feel of being on a mountain? Um, and I did It feel like it really supported, interestingly, somewhat what you said, that sense of this body as a mountain, it's stable, right? Um, so I would really love for folks to consider that, making a date with a place that feels earthy and supportive of you. And you don't, you really do not have to leave town. Just being in a park, being next to a tree, and um, all of that will work. Did I see, is there something online? Okay, just something in. I just added the Donna. Um, oh, cool. See, and, I'm trying and to. And notice, but that's, that's it. That's it. Okay. Thanks, Jason. I'm about to get glasses. 
Um, so it is. Well, let's dedicate the merit of our practice here. And taking a moment to reconnect to the body, the breath. And finding and feeling the true motivation for this practice. Our ability to transform our heart, body, and mind so that we can be more available and of service to, to all beings and this planet. And placing palms together in front of the heart if it feels comfortable. And considering, consider dedicating the merit of this practice to all beings as well as the more than human world of this earth that all beings could feel connection and grounded, that our earth could be protected and supported, that each and every being on this entire planet could be free. Thank you all. Really great to be here. Next week, water. Ooh. And we have a couple exciting things coming up. Um, some of you heard an announcement about Wangyal Rinpoche. Uh, Gnome and our beautiful board have been looking for a space for Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche, the author of this book and an amazing teacher. Uh, to join us, it will be on a Wednesday. So it's like a Wednesday crew kind of thing. And he will be talking about soul retrieval and the themes of this book with us, which would be great. It will be in a different location because he's, you know, he's a really big deal. I mean, a lot of people. So tickets are on sale now online. We're not tickets per se. It's a fundraiser. No one will be turned away for lack of funds. There will be at least 100 plus seats, but you know, you might want to reserve yours. March 28th, that'll be one. 27th, just kidding, it's a Wednesday. And um, I'll be doing a half day here, March 16th, uh, for folks who want to join, kind of deepening our practice of stillness, um, silence and spaciousness. And there are probably other fun things coming up. 